spiders will eat your face. Available on Amazon Prime Instant Watch and Amazon.com. Spiders will eat your face. The brilliant documentary about the history of pet tarantulas in America. That's Spiders Will Eat Your Face, the movie, now on Amazon. Success Media Network. 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 This is your show. Good day, successors. I'm Antonio Holman, and welcome to the Four Principles of Success, number 32, where I chat with successful people and entrepreneurs about how they enhance their businesses and lives in the areas of knowledge, health, wealth, and spirituality. Today, we're talking to Dr. Glenn Livingston. Dr. Glenn, a veteran psychologist, is located in Portland, Oregon, and is the author of the book, Never Binge Again, as well as a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. Disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer to the overweight and food-obsessed male, Dr. Glenn spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating by working with his own patients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. Most important, however, was his own personal journey out of the obesity and food prison to a normal, healthy weight and a much more lighthearted relationship with food. Dr. Glenn, are you ready to help our listeners prepare for success? I'm certainly ready to help your listeners, and I'm happy to be here. All right. Now, this is going to be an exciting show because health is always fun, and a lot of people are struggling with it. But before we get into it, uh, Dr. Glenn, tell us a little bit about your personal life. Well, I love to do these podcasts, and I like to hike, and I like to work with work with clients. I teach a lot of webinars. Um, I work at home. I... Um, I've actually always worked at home since I was 26 years old, since after I got my PhD. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm a self-starter, very organized person, um, make appointment with myself for the important things so that the important is never at the tyranny of the urgent. And um, I believe that a life of discipline is better than a life of regret, like Jim Rohn said. Oh, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Brilliant guy and always had brilliant words. And man, I totally believe that as well. For those who may not know, tell us a little bit more about your book, Never Binge Again, and what inspired you to write it. Well, let me first say that even though I was originally inspired by my personal struggle and by the interest in helping men, it turns out that the majority of my clients uh, turned out to be women, which was a surprise to me um, because I discovered a set of principles that seems to work for um, women equally as well as men, and men are actually less interested in doing it, which was a very big surprise to me. But but um, my personal story with binge eating is that I, I had, when I was an adolescent and young adult, what you would call exercise bulimia. And what that means is that I'm, I'm 6'4 and I'm reasonably muscular. And I discovered that if I exercised for you know two or three hours a day, I could really eat whatever I wanted to. I mean, you know, 6,000, 7,000 calories a day was really no problem. I, I would stay thin and muscular. And I thought it was a superpower. I didn't think it was a problem. Uh, you know, a whole pizza, sometimes two, um, mu- muffins, lattes, uh, I, I'm not the kind of guy that would take a couple of squares of chocolate off of the bar and fold up the rest neatly for Sunday like my sister can. I, I don't know what's wrong with that woman. <laughs> I'm the kind of I, I'm the kind of guy that you know would have would have a couple of bars and then wash it down with Dunkin' Donuts and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I've done just about everything with food that is possible to be ashamed of: eating out of the garbage, uh, taking my roommate's food, you know, when he got a care package from home. Um, a- anything you can imagine that people feel shame about, I've I've done in the past, saying that I wouldn't do it again, and then doing it over and over and over again. And you know what what happened was when I got a little older. I'm from a family of 17 psychologists and psychotherapists, by the way. So my mom and my dad and my aunts and my uncles and my grandma and my sister and her husband and my parents, my parents are divorced, so they're their spouses. Everybody is a psychologist or counselor or social worker. And so 
when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, um, which is important because it led me to follow a traditional psychological route that didn't really work. I'll explain why a little later um, in order to try to fix the problem. But I, I first became aware that I really had a problem when I, I was older and, you know, I had adult responsibilities. I was working with patients in a very serious environment. I, I worked with couples who had just gotten past an affair or affair, an affair had just been discovered. I work with suicidal adolescents and young adults. And all of these, all of these situations required my full presence and it required a lot of time because when you work with high risk situations, you not only spend the hours that you're spending with your patients, but you have to journal about them and seek supervision and go read, read some things in books. And, you know, be, being a doctor in those situations is a fairly serious thing. And it was very important to me because my identity first and foremost was always to be a psychologist that was you know, doing good in the world. And I found that I couldn't because I, I, I couldn't be as effective as I wanted to be. I couldn't be as present as I wanted to be because I'd be sitting there with a suicidal kid and thinking, when can I go to the delicatessen and dislodge my jaw and empty the contents of the deli tray into it? Um, and, and that really, really bothered me. I felt like I was not in integrity. I, um, I was not enjoying my life. It was not turning out the way that I wanted to. I accomplished a lot of things. You know, I, I don't have kids and I never commuted. So I always had a lot of time for my career and I, you know, I, I was consulting for Fortune 100 companies at the same time I was developing a practice, but I just was never really present and I was never really as effective as I wanted to be. And I was always, I was always overcoming the bloat and the excess calories and my triglycerides had shot up past 800. I think there were 1100 one time, but I have a test that said they were 820 something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's scary. And the doctors were telling me, look, every male in your family has had a heart attack. Um, you know, by the time that they were 50, you're probably going to have one by the time that you're 40, if not, you know, 35, if you don't stop this. And I couldn't. So being a psychologist, I went to some of the best psychologists around. And as, as you can imagine from that family, I had a lot of connections. And I went to Overeaters Anonymous and I went to um, psychiatrists to take medication. I, I did everything I could based on the idea that it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. This notion that, um, this notion that it, you really had to love yourself then. There must be something psychologically wrong with me that was causing me to binge. And I, I even funded my own study uh, this was back in the days when clicks were cheap on the internet. And I got 40,000 people to take a test, which told me what they had trouble, what kind of food they had trouble controlling as compared to different issues in their life and personality factors. And I discovered a lot of interesting things. Like, for example, people that had a lot of trouble with chocolate, like I do, they tended to be lonely or brokenhearted. Mm. And that made a lot of sense to me. I was you know, in a bad marriage at the time. And, um, I was not particularly happy and I was feeling lonely and brokenhearted. And, um, I actually went back and I talked to my mom about the finding and she, and I asked her, is there anything in my upbringing that would lead you to believe that, you know, I have trouble with chocolate because I was feeling lonely or brokenhearted. And she said, well, Glenn, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but when, when you were little, when you were two or three years old, your, your dad was a captain in the army and we were frightened he was going to be sent to Vietnam. And so I was really overwhelmed. And my dad, your grandfather was missing um, and, or, or he had just come back or something and she was getting over feeling depressed about that. He'd been missing for nine months and she didn't have the wherewithal to, you know, hug me and love me when, I would come to her crying or she didn't always have the wherewithal to make me a meal or feed me what I needed to be fed. And so she kept a bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup. I'm dating myself with that, that <laughs> reference because um, that brand is not around anymore. Right. Right? Um, but there was a bottle of chocolate Bosco in the refrigerator on the floor. And she said, Glenn, go, go get your Bosco. 
go get your Voscom. And and so when she said that, I thought that I would be able to immediately stop binging. I thought I'd be able to stop overeating because how could you make a better connection? There was the pattern right there, right there in front of me. But it didn't really work. Now, it was worth having the conversation because I could forgive myself. I could understand what happened better. I could forgive my mom. My mom and I got closer as a result of having that conversation. And those type of soulful conversations about food can be really valuable psychologically. But they don't really, in my experience, stop the binge because st- stopping overeating is more like being a fireman than being a detective to figure out who lit the match. And so I, in figuring out that pattern with the Bosco on the floor, I effectively figured out where the match was struck, how the fire started. But there was still this raging fire, and it didn't really matter how it started. I had to figure out how to put it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, 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 so what would happen would be there was this little voice inside of me that would say, you know what, Glenn? You're right. Your mama didn't love you enough. And there's this great big hole inside of you. And until you figure out how to fig that hole, we're just going to have to go on and binge. We're going to have to keep binging until we do that. Yippee, let's keep doing it. And I found similar things with the patients that I was working with um, and even across the different foods. So, so for example, I found that people who struggle with, um, with, with salty, crunchy things like chips and pretzels, they tend to be more stressed at work. And people who struggle with uh, soft, floury things like pasta and bread and bagels, they tend to be more stressed at home. These were not perfect correlations, but they were there. And so they had similar voices inside of them. And I wasn't quite sure what to do about that for a while. I was investigating all the psychological issues. And then I, I, when I really got into a crisis, I, a physical crisis, I started researching alternative addiction treatments. And one of the gentlemen I came across, his name was Jack Trimpey, and he wrote a book called Rational Recovery. And he essentially explained, I'm paraphrasing, and he works with black and white addictions, mostly like um, drugs and alcohol, the kinds of things you can give up entirely as opposed to having to modulate like food. But what he essentially said was, look, the brain has two parts. There's the, um, there's the lizard brain, and when the lizard brain looks at something in the environment, I'm really paraphrasing what he said, but it, it says, eat, mate, or kill. Do I eat it, do I mate with it, or do I kill it? And the lizard brain has no concern for love. The lizard brain has no concern for creativity or the people that are important to you or art or music or any of the other things that we traditionally associate with being human and you know contributing to society. The lizard brain is just this eat, mate, or kill entity within us which is essentially sociopathic. It, it developed before the herd was very important. It, it developed before, um, you know, before all of these notions had anything to do with our existence on the planet. And you don't want to love that thing more. Um, what you want to do is distance yourself from it and learn how to hear its hear its strivings as something that can be dangerous for you so that you can make decisions, not have it make decisions. And that principle really flipped the paradigm for me. I realized that, um, you know, the the second part of the brain is the the upper brain or the, the neocortex, the logical thinking brain. And that's the part of the brain that can delay gratification and, and, orient us towards longer term goals and interests and connect to other people and do all the things that are really important to us. And he, he said that what you, you want to do is um, really draw a very clear line between them. And he does that for drugs and alcohol by saying, I will never blank again. I won't drink again. I will never use again, et cetera, et cetera. And I tell people to go research his work if they want to know more about drugs and alcohol. But 
what I decided to do with food was experiment with that by drawing some very clear lines for myself with food. And so, for example, for me personally, I said I will never eat chocolate again. Now, in our culture, that's heresy. In our culture, people say you can't say never again. And we'll talk about more about why people are reticent to think like that. But just for the moment, and I'm not saying that everybody has to not eat chocolate, just for me personally, I decided to draw that line. And once I did, I could say, this, this is the embarrassing part for me because it, I'm a very sophisticated psychologist with all these you know, millions of dollars of consulting behind me. But what worked for me to stop overeating was to say, I've got a pig inside me. My lizard brain is my pig. And, um, and chocolate is pig slop since I will never have chocolate again. Chocolate is pig slop. And whenever I hear the lizard brain saying anything about why chocolate would be okay, that's pig squeal. And mm -hmm. when the pig squeals, I say, I don't listen. I, don't listen. I never eat chocolate. I don't listen to farm animals squealing for pig slop. And I never let them tell me what to do. Mm. And that crazy primitive um, mind game, it snapped things into place for me like never before. And the reason that it did that was because I stopped trying to love myself thin and I started trying to capture and cage this rabbit animal inside me instead. And that gave me those extra microseconds that I needed at the moment of impulse when I really, I, you know, I'm kind of a sophisticated psychologist and I, I work with a lot of you know, I'm trained in the scientific method and I understand the rigor of validation and all that. And, but th there were no studies that prove that you could just not eat pig slop and, <laughs> and don't let farm animals tell you what to do. Right. And, um, and I still don't have those studies because I don't have the resources to, um, to conduct them. But, but you know, uh, th this is what worked for me. I, 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 don't let, I don't let farm animals tell me to eat pig slop. And I had to do a lot of experimentation with different types of rules. And, you know, there were conditional rules, like I, I would never have pretzels outside of a major league baseball game, or um, there were always rules, like I'd always have five servings of fruits and vegetables each day. And I realized that it was very important for me to take ownership of a custom food plan for myself personally. And Slowly but surely, I made a whole bunch of modifications and I developed a system that really worked for me. And I, you know, got, you know, I, I lost about 50 pounds and my triglycerides came down and I was able to, more importantly, lose the, the mental obsession. I, I no longer was frightened all day long about what was I going to eat? When was I going to eat it? How was I going to stop? How was I going to recover from it? When was I going to get enough exercise to make up for the calories? And my life became about other things besides the food. I was suddenly a lot more present and able to, to function. So that, that's my story in a nutshell. There are a whole bunch of issues we could talk about to make it more practical and useful to people. Well, you know, We could talk about the objection to nevers. We could talk about why food is such a big problem in our society today and um, you know how to how to understand reorienting yourself to food so that uh, ending overeating becomes a real possibility um, we could talk about developing a custom food plan what, wherever you want to go with it Antonio but that's that's my story in a nutshell yeah I love that I, I love all of this stuff uh, I'm a big uh, health nut and health information nut so this is this is great uh, now, you mentioned having more women patients than uh, male patients. What do you believe is the psychology behind that phenomenon? Is it vanity? Is it old school gender role type thinking? What is it? Um, you know, I don't really know. I, I wish I had a brilliant answer for that, but I, 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 I have more women that hate, that hate me also um, because <laughs> they – say that they shouldn't have a pig inside of them and they were called a pig when they were young. And I, I, I tell them that they don't have to call it a pig. You can call it a slacker, your inner slacker, and you can call it slacker screeches and slacker slops. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's the principle of separating from that lizard brain that really works as opposed to loving yourself back to health. I, I think perhaps women are more... Um, concerned about their weight than men are overall because they're in our society unfortunately judged more for their weight than men tend to be um, so I think that could be part of it I think that part of it could be that 
women are initially more taken by the love yourself thin principle and so are more likely to resonate with the story of that not having worked for them and therefore looking for something different like this. Um, but I, I'm not entirely sure why it resonates more with women than men, but it, but it does. Now, um, health is definitely a huge topic in the United States with uh, food marketing and manufacturing globalization. It's all starting to get worldwide, and it's starting to be a worldwide concern. You know, a uh, good, good example is how a lot of Americanized uh, eating uh, manufacturing and things like that have reached over to Asia. And there seems to be a growing diabetic issue over in Asia as well. Um, how, how do people begin to stop overeating and stress eating and binge eating while actually sticking to a good, healthy diet? Well, I'll mention that my, my book is diet agnostic, um, but I won't make any secret of the fact that I am an advocate of whole, fresh, ripe, raw, natural foods. Um, and I believe what Doug Graham says, that if you control the quality of your food, that the quantity will take care of itself. Um, people are typically not binge eating broccoli. People are typically not, you know, binge eating um, bananas. They're binge eating industrial foods. And what, one of the things I know, and this gets into why overeating is such a problem today. One of the things I know from consulting for big food and big advertising is that there are billions of dollars that go into concentrating sources of artificial pleasure into a small space, um, making these hyper palatable food-like substances which contain as much starch or fat or sugar or oil or excitotoxins or salt or a variety of different chemicals and flavor enhancers that artificially stimulate our pleasure centers in ways that evolution didn't prepare us for. And then big advertising convinces us that we can't live without them. And the addiction treatment um, industry says that we're powerless to resist. And those three things become a perfect storm for addiction on a mass level. Now, if you look at so I, I think the cause is very much external. Um, and I think that part of the solution involves getting good and mad at what's happening and taking a stand at least internally against it so that you're not just willfully going along and letting, you know, letting the economic forces program you to self-destruct on a, you know, on a not so slow um, long-term basis. But if you look at the research on what happens when you artificially stimulate pleasure centers, there, there's a series of studies done with rats in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s by researchers, I think their names were Milner and Olds. And they inserted electrodes in the pleasure centers of rats' brains, and they connected those the connection of those electrodes to a lever. But by the way, I don't think that these studies were ethical from an animal care basis. And, um, you know, but they, they were done and they really illustrated an important point. So I'd like to talk about them. But the, I don't think they could be done today in the way that they were done. Anyway, they connected the pleasure center to a lever that the rats could use to self stimulate. And what, we, what they found was that rats would not only press the lever thousands of times a day, but would do it to the exclusion of their legitimate health and survival needs. So starving rats would ignore the food next to them to run over and push the lever for artificial pleasure stimulation. Um, nursing mothers would abandon their pups, their little baby rats, in order to go press the lever. These rats would cross very painful electrical grids to go press the lever. And what that tells us is that in the mammalian brain, and the human brain is a little bit different, but not that much different. And there are studies that indicate similar things happen in humans. In the mammalian brain, when the opportunity to self-stimulate the pleasure center in an artificial way is provided, it causes self-neglect. It's, it's possible to hijack the pleasure center of the human brain and redirect 
all of an organism's life energy towards that artificial pleasure at the severe expense of their health. And I don't think it's an extreme to say that that's what's happening today in society. I think that big food is manufacturing those artificial pleasure buttons and we're all driven to press them at the expense of our health. And once you realize that's what's going on, you can start to get angry and you, know, you, you might decide that you want to have some of those pleasure buttons in your life anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm all for people making their own decisions and I think we fought wars for the freedom to make choices in our society, including the choice to live fast and die young if that's what we want to do. Um, but I think that people should be able to make fully informed choices and know, and, and know exactly what's going on before they make the choice as opposed to walking around singing a jingle and being duped by advertising into thinking that this thing is actually healthy for you. Um, and, and, and so, you know, w with all of these forces conspiring against you and the, the addiction treatment industry saying that, um, you know, overeating is a disease when there's no evidence that it's a disease. Um, and that, you know, the only cure is this, you know, spiritual solution, which is really old time religion. Um, they'll say that it's not religious, but there are, are 11 Supreme Court decisions to the contrary. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really messed up situation and it's a perfect storm to get all of society overeating. However, and here, here's the good news. If you realize that that's what's going on and you step back and you say, okay, well, what do I believe healthy eating is? And you make even one rule for yourself. Maybe it's I never eat chocolate on a weekday. I'll only ever eat chocolate on a Saturday or Sunday again. And you make even one rule for yourself that predetermines your food decisions around that troubled behavior. Then it turns out that that's a decision of character. And decisions of character trump willpower. So I'll often ask people, you, you could phrase the question in two different, in two different ways. Could you avoid chocolate? Could you, could you avoid even one ounce of chocolate during weekdays between now and the day that you die? And most people will say, oh, no, I could never do that. And then if I say, well, could you become this sort of person who doesn't eat chocolate during the week? They say, oh, I could do that. And, and the reason is that we're already set up to make decisions of character and live by decisions of character so that we are not draining our willpower with constant decisions all day long. Decision making is a mental muscle. Willpower is a fatigable quantity. We wake up with a certain amount each morning and we can only make so many good decisions during the day. But if you've decided that, you know, a priori, you don't eat chocolate during the week, then every time you pass a chocolate bar at Starbucks is not another drain on your willpower because you've, you're not trying to make that decision. If you say, well, I mostly avoid chocolate 90% of the time, and then you pass a chocolate bar at Starbucks. You have to ask yourself, is this part of the 90% or is this part of the 10% every single time? And you're draining your mental energy and eventually people wind up giving in. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example to prove to you that character trumps willpower. Suppose you walk into a diner and the waitress says, I'm just going to go get the menus. I'll be right back. And she sits you down at the table and there's a $20 bill at the table because she forgot to pick up her tip from the last um, large crowd. I guess it must have been a large crowd if it was 20 bucks. And there is no camera. There's nobody out front. Nobody can see you. There's no window by the table. You could take that $20 bill if you want to and she might not know any different. And the question is, do you take the $20 bill? And 99% of the people that I talked to said they would never do that. And I asked them, would it require any willpower for them not to do that? So they say, oh, no, of course not. And I'll say, well, why doesn't it require willpower for you to do that? And they'll say, well, because I'm not a thief. And <laughs> I, right? So they make a statement of character. Yeah. They, they've decided a priori that they don't steal tips from waitresses. That's not the kind of person that they are. And so I would say, if you can make a decision not to steal tips from waitresses because that's not the kind of person you are, why can't you make another decision to say, I don't eat chocolate during the week? Um, and the truth is that you can. And so when you combine these 
very clear, bright line statements that, you know, draw a clear distinction between what's healthy behavior and what's unhealthy behavior in your mind. And you say um, any little thought and you, you decide that your lizard brain is the one that would try to convince you to overstep that line. And any little thought that that lizard brain throws out at you that says um, you should, you know, you should eat that chocolate at the Starbucks counter because cocoa beans grow on a plant and therefore chocolate is a vegetable. Um, you know immediately that that's pig squeal and you can ignore it. There's no point in engaging with that and debating it because you know where it's coming from. You know that it's not consistent with the character decisions that you've made about who you are with food. And you've got this very primitive, guttural way of identifying and ignoring that, that problem so you can make the right decision every time. And then that doesn't drain your willpower because your decisions have already been made for you. Um, and it turns out when you do that, the noise in your head dies down really quickly. It's, um, you know, most people feel like they could not stop eating X, Y, or Z because they would experience torturous cravings and constant, um, constant food thoughts. But it turns out, uh, and, th and this principle is very well researched, it's called the principle of neuroplasticity, that which fires together, wires together. And if the reason, the reason that you're having those cravings is because you indulge those cravings, the reason that you're continuing to have the obsessive food thoughts about the chocolate is because you've reinforced those thoughts by feeding it chocolate when they come up. And if you start to ignore it, um, as Catherine Hansen says, the way that you might, you might ignore an alarm clock, you will find very quickly, usually within, within a matter of a month or so, and um, progressively along that whole first month, that those food thoughts die down. It's um, it's similar to the behavior of a prisoner that's been given a life sentence. Eventually, they don't really want to hope, and they don't really want to. Um, they don't really want to keep screaming to be let out because that just becomes a way to exhaust their energy, and they turn their energy to other things. And that, that's what happens with your brain when you draw those lines and you cease the behavior and you make it really clear to your lizard brain that no, I don't indulge these thoughts, then those thoughts start to extinguish and you have peace and presence a lot more quickly than you think that you will. I mean, it's a very, very powerful technique. It's a very, very powerful principle. Um, it's really a kind of a hack for um, for an Eastern philosophy of ignoring the monkey mind. But I'm, I'm not I've never really been a meditator. It's hard for me to sit still. Um, my, my girlfriend always tells me I should start meditating and my partner tells me I should start meditating. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I probably will, but it's not, my, um, it's not my forte. But this hack worked for me very quickly where meditation didn't. And it's been working for thousands of other people along the way. So um, I forgot the original question, but you got me up on a soapbox and I, I went on for a while. So. No, that's, that's okay. It's good. It, it it's funny because uh, you you really uh, shed a light on how it's like a tug of war between your primal thoughts and your uh, human rationalization. You know, it's it's always a back and forth. I mean, you naturally want this, but then you have to steer the bus in a different direction because you know this will benefit you more. I mean, it's it's very much like the traditional angel and devil on your shoulder. So I I didn't make this up. But I believe that I've codified it and narrated it in a way that's more accessible to people who aren't necessarily religious or, you know, who are looking for the simplest, simplest possible way to effectively implement what um, what people are doing who naturally mature out of a lot of these behaviors anyway. You know that there are there are a lot of people who will say that they were addicted to X, Y, or Z in their youth, but they grew out of it. And if you talk to them in detail about how they grew out of it, they will tell you a story about these voices in their heads that, you know, they had the healthy voice and they had, they had the unhealthy voice and they learned how to listen to the healthy one. And so this is just a way of accelerating that process and really drawing the lines more clearly, um, actively paying attention to those voices and developing the muscle to ignore 
the unhealthy voice um, in a very practical way. Now, do you still consume chocolate in small amounts? I mean, they say it's healthy, right? Well, um, yes, I, I have I have no quarrels with the idea that the antioxidants and other compounds in chocolate could be healthy for other people. I personally find that never is a lot easier than sometimes for me. Um, I have a lot of clients who I help to eat chocolate in small amounts um, or help them to eat it conditionally at social events or weekends or something like that. And that works really well for a lot of people. Not for me. I, I have I have too many memories of binging on chocolate and it um, there were too many risk factors with my triglycerides and cardiovascular genetics to continue to allow myself to think of that as part of my personal food bullseye. Mm. Um, so I, I found that never was a lot easier than sometimes. And that, that's one of the things on my never list that I just don't make mistakes with. Um, it's, it's been years. I no longer have cravings at all for it. I can walk by the big display of chocolate bars at the supermarket checkout line. And it, it, it might as well be, you know, it just looks like a big, a big wrapper of chemicals to me. I, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have the cravings anymore. Wow. Um, yeah. Now, now most people don't want to do that. Most people don't want to say never. Most people want to say sometimes, and I think that's perfectly fine. What I do argue for is if you are having trouble with any given food in any given way, I would argue for making a well-articulated decision about how you want that food to be in your life, in what situation, under what circumstances, and make those decisions beforehand because at the moment of impulse, you're not going to have access to your um, very logical decision-making brain. Um, you know, the, the lizard brain is going to be woken up and you're going to want to just, you know, let it do its thing. So it's much better to articulate what you want to do with that substance beforehand. What are a few ways people can begin to permanently reprogram themselves like maybe today to uh, start thinking differently about food and health? Okay. Well, for, first of all, we, the, the, the basic way is to pick one food or trouble behavior. And this could, this could have nothing to do with food. It could be, um, I never eat while I'm standing up. Or I always, I always take three deep breaths before I begin a meal or I always put my fork down between bites. If, there could be habits that you want to integrate into your life that – foster a more mindful connection and a more um, present experience with food so you can actually enjoy it and slow down. It'd be like a, so, like a Pavlovian response. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, well, you're actually interrupting the Pavlovian response. So you're making a more conscious decision about how you do want to respond. Oh, I see. Um, but, you know, pick, pick one rule. I will never have chocolate during the week. I will always drink two glasses of water when I wake up in the morning. I will always put my fork down between bites. I will always write a hypothetical food plan for the next day before going to sleep, which I can change if I want to, but at least I will have thought it through. Um, Pick pick one rule that you think would make a dramatic difference in your life and make sure that that rule is free of ambiguity so that if you gave that rule to 10 observers and said, hey, follow me around all day, and at the end of the day, I'm going to ask all 10 of you, did I follow this rule or not? You want that rule to be written in such a way that all 10 of them would agree. So it's, it's a very, very bright line, and there's no, there's no ambiguity. There's no questioning whether you followed it or not. So for example, I will always eat when I'm hungry, only when I'm hungry and always stop when I'm full. That's a really good guideline, but that's not a never binge again kind of rule. The reason is it's a very internal experience, and those 10 observers couldn't figure out if you really were hungry or you really were full. So there are some things that are healthy guidelines, kind of like your North Star that you aim towards, but you can't ever really tell with 100% certainty if you did it or not. And that's not the kind of thing that this method really helps you with. It's a good thing to do, but it's not really the kind of thing this method helps you with. Pick a rule that 10 people could agree upon observing you for a whole day, whether you followed it or not. And then then what you want to do is um, consider that rule to be your, your perfect bullseye. And just like an archer aiming for the target, you want to 
purge any doubt or insecurity that you have about your ability to hit that bullseye from your mind so that you can actually see the arrow going into the target. So th this is different than the way that most people think about aiming for a food goal. Most people think about progress, not perfection. But I find that when you say that as you're aiming for the bullseye, that really means you're just going to try for a little while until you don't feel like it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I find that you have to aim with perfection, aim with the goal of perfection. And if you happen to miss, you don't just turn around and shoot all the rest of the hours at the audience and say, screw it. You get up and you aim with perfection again. And when you are allowing yourself to be fully present with that aim, and you, almost as if you were the bullseye, almost as if you were merged with the target, then suddenly every little voice that says that you can't, you, you won't be able to hit the bullseye, you can't cross the bullseye, you shouldn't try to hit the bullseye, every little voice that's in your head becomes much clearer. And you can say, oh, well, that's, that's just my pig and I don't, I don't have to listen to farm animals now. And by purging that doubt and insecurity from your mind, you have a lot more energy to concentrate on the bullseye. Um, and then if, if you make a mistake, you're kind to yourself and you say, well, you know, did I not account for the wind? And um, was I standing a little too far from the target? Didn't I, did I pull the, did I pull my arm back far enough? Um, what was it that would help me to aim better next time? And you do it again. And if you continue to get up and aim for the bullseye with that type of perfectionistic attitude, then you can't help but get better. It's th the reason that people don't do well and they fall down is because there's this little voice inside of them that says, oh, you know, you made a mistake, therefore you're nothing. You can't do this. You'll have to try another diet. And until you do, let's just keep on binging. Um, that's, that's the reason that people keep messing up. They let that, they let that negative voice overtake them. Um, but if you accidentally touched a hot stove... You wouldn't perseverate and say, oh, my God, I'm pathetic. I'm a compulsive hot stove toucher. I'm never going to be able to stop <laughs> touching hot stove, right? Yeah. You, would, you, you would feel pain for a moment, and the, the pain in this instance corresponds to a certain amount of guilt or shame. But just for a little bit to get your attention and figure out why didn't you see the hot stove? How are you going to avoid doing that in the future? And then you would just go back to your life, which includes not touching hot stoves. Right, it includes a new new learning about where that one hot stove was, and you're not going to touch it again, and you wouldn't obsess about it. It turns out that the purpose of that negative voice is to convince you that that you are too weak to avoid binging in the future. It's actually a binge motivated voice. It fools people into thinking, well, if I beat myself up hard enough, then I will have been punished for this binge and therefore I'm not going to do it. But it, it turns out to work the opposite. The, the negative, self-castigating, punishing voice actually makes you feel so weak that you wind up binging more. And it's very, very difficult to continue binging if you refuse to yell at yourself. And Car Carol Munter taught me that first. Um, so on a practical basis, draw a line in the sand. Make a rule for your single most difficult trouble food or behavior. Aim with perfection. Give yourself permission to aim with perfection. Purge the doubt and insecurity from your mind. And if you make a mistake, figure out what happened and get up and do it again. Your aim will get better and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good place to start. Now, with uh, meal plan type services, uh, why do you feel that meal plan services would be a better option than a person actually making their own meal plan? You think there's a possibility that some people may go too light on themselves. Um, I prefer that people eventually come to their own meal plan because I find that people don't stay on, on pre-existing meal plans forever. Um, but pre-existing meal plans can be a really quick way to have all your decisions made for you and you know, all of those bright lines drawn for you without having to think too much. If you're going to do that, I would recommend that you go over the pre-existing meal plan in detail and take ownership of it. See if you agree with it, see why you agree with it, and then make a commitment to follow it because it's essentially become yours. Um, Antonio, I find 
that when people implement this method, they typically don't go too light on themselves. They typically go too hard on themselves. Mm. There is an excitement and enthusiasm which develops when people realize they've got the power to stop a behavior. And when for many, many years, sometimes their whole life, they've been taught that they don't have that power. And they get carried away with that enthusiasm and they make too many rules and they make their diets too restrictive. And they are then putting their body into a, a, a survival mode um, where there's a sense of starvation. And I very strongly believe that there's an evolutionary mechanism in the brain that says if our body must go through these periods where there are not enough calories and nutrition available, then when calories and nutrition are available, we're going to have to hoard them. And I believe that is the binge response. Most binge eaters that I talk to have had the experience where they felt like someone was holding a gun to their head and forcing them to eat by the refrigerator, even though they were full. Wow. And I believe that that's the evolutionary response that's causing us to hoard calories. And I have more success with people who are willing to lose weight slowly. And sometimes with a lot of people, the first goal is just to stop binging and to stop gaining weight. And sometimes for a couple of months, I work with people to just stop the binges and have enough rules so that they're never really hungry and they don't feel like binging. And then then we start to add rules that restrict calories just a little bit, um, add some more whole, fresh, right for our natural foods. Um, and you know, then they start to lose weight you know, a pound or two a week. Um, I, I prefer one pound over two pounds because I have more long-term success with people who lose weight slowly. So I, I find people are actually too hard on themselves, not too lenient on themselves when they do this. Um, I, I have seen occasionally people that are not hard enough, but it's rare. Hmm. Now you've been a psychologist for a while. What, what in the world of psychology still really excites you today? Um, what excites me in psychology is the is the understanding from self psychologists and object relations theorists that no man is really an island. We used to think that our identity as um, masters of our own fates could be completed. And that you could get to the point that you really didn't need other people's opinions of you or other people or connection with other people to maintain your identity, maintain self-esteem and a good feeling about yourself. We still think that a large degree of independence is important and you know to strive to be able to stabilize your identity, even if you're the only only person in the room who thinks something is um, is very important. But we know now that we, we all really need each other. We all really need to have other people in our life who sustain us to a certain extent and that it's actually more mature to accept that than to see it as a weakness. Um, and that excites me and helping people understand that excites me. So life, of course, is a giant roller coaster and it's ups and downs and who knows what's around the corner. Um, throughout your journey, what do you feel was the time where you felt most personally unsuccessful? The most unsuccessful period of my life was when I was totally immersed in binge eating. I was almost 260 pounds. I was not exercising. I had a business venture, which put me $700,000 in debt. Um, I was not happy in my marriage. And I really, um, you know, if I weren't a psychologist and I were not... um, I didn't have all the supports around me that I did. I, I could have been suicidal at that time. So that that was the most unsuccessful period of my life. And um, you know, I thank God I persisted and figured out a way out. But yeah, I, I've I've been as down in the dumps as anybody has been out there. Hang tight, successors. We'll return to our conversation with Dr. Glenn Livingston as well as quick success after a word from our sponsors. Spiders will eat your face. Available on Amazon Prime Instant Watch and Amazon.com. Spiders will eat your face. The brilliant documentary about the history of pet tarantulas in America. That Spiders will eat your face. The movie now on Amazon. Are you a tense, tired, busy person who works day in and day out who tends to lack the proper sleep and energy? 
Using modular supplements, health-related articles, recipes, life hacks, and more, Bellison can help. With quality as high as Bellison, you're buying from a company that cares about the environment and only uses premium vegan supplements. That's Bellison.com. Want to learn how to cook healthy, exercise, and meditate in just 30 minutes a day? Bellison.com. Want to feel healthy, energetic, and focused like me? Bellison.com. To receive a 10% discount at checkout, visit Bellison.com with the coupon code THE4POS. Visit Bellison.com now. That's B-E-L-I-S-A-N.com. Compassion and quality without compromise. Bellison.com. And we're back with author and psychologist Dr. Glenn Livingston. Now we get into the part of the show I like to call Quick Success, where you, Dr. Glenn, can inspire the successors to enhance their lives in the areas of knowledge, health, wealth, and spirituality. Dr. Glenn, what are you currently doing to enhance your knowledge? I am reading. um, I'm reading my competitor's books, and I am am working with four different coaches at the time, and I am... Go, I'm so sorry about that. I am going to um, going to start going to meditation lessons. What are you currently doing to enhance your health? I have become a raw vegan um, in recent times, and I am going to a week long seminar in Seattle um, in September to learn more culinary skills and enhance my knowledge of how to um, sustain myself on a raw vegan diet. What are you currently doing to enhance your wealth? I am investing in my business. I've always found that I make more money from my business than the stock market. So I am hiring five coaches to help handle the overflow and turning this into a real business. And we actually have offers from Random House and offers from investors. And this is going to be um, something which hopefully sets me up for retirement. What are you currently doing to enhance your spirituality? Um, Not enough. I am looking into meditation and I am taking yoga three times a week. What do you feel is one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received? Um, The... Best piece of advice that I ever received is that the onus is on the communicator. And so if I am not getting the response that I want in my desired communicatee, then I need to take a different angle. Um, I can't blame the communicatee for not understanding what I have to say. It's my responsibility to figure out their unique personality and communicate in a way that works with them. Are there any modern technologies or apps that help you achieve success? Yeah, I use... Todoist and Gmail and IFTCT in a unique combination to implement the um, getting things done methodology. And Dr. Glenn has a special offer. Dr. Glenn, what is that? Well, I have set it up for you all to get a copy of the book for free um, in electronic format, the Kindle, the Nook, the PDF, um, along with a set of food plan starter templates. And more importantly, since we've been talking about this all in theory, I recorded a whole bunch of coaching sessions that so you can hear how people actually implement it in practice. It's all free. It's at neverbingeagain.com. Just click the big red free bonus button and um, put your email in and you'll get that. And there you have it, Successors, an exclusive offer just for you from Dr. Glenn, a free copy of his book at neverbingeagain.com. Successors, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Glenn Livingston. Please check out more successful free content like this at the4pos.com, as well as rate and review wherever you find your podcast. Thanks for listening and prepare for success. Thanks, Dr. Glenn. Th- thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. If you want to be more driven and more motivated in your life or business, go to the4pos.com forward slash free book and grab a copy of my book, Indulge Your Affirmative Motivation Within, 25 Motivations of Personal Development and Life Success. Get it now at the4pos.com forward slash free book. Again, that's the4pos.com forward slash free book. Spiders will eat your face. Available on Amazon Prime Instant Watch and Amazon.com. Spiders Will Eat Your Face, the brilliant documentary about the history of pet tarantulas in America. That's Spiders Will Eat Your Face, the movie, now on Amazon.